Alrighty. Well, welcome to our class called The Sacrifice of Christ in the Old and New Testament. We'll be examining types and prophecies in the Old Testament of the coming Christ and their fulfillment in the person of Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, here I have an outline of the 13 courses I tend to follow. Lord willing, he may lead us differently, but tonight we'll just do an introduction. Uh, the next five weeks we'll spend looking at the five major offerings of the Old Testament. Uh, the burnt offering, the meat offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and then the trespass offering. And we'll conclude our portion of the, in the Old Testament with prophecies concerning the sacrifice of Christ. And we'll, around week eight, go to the New Testament, look at the sacrifice of Christ according to Matthew and Mark. I, I think those counts are similar enough we can include them in one week. Then we'll look at Luke's account the following week and John's account, as well as possibly hit a portion of First John. Then we'll look at a sacrifice of Christ in the epistles of Peter and Paul. And there's quite a bit to cover there. And Twelfth week, we'll look in the book of Hebrews, and I do think there's enough there to have its own week of study. In the last week, we'll do a conclusion review, tie up any loose ends we may have. And for any of those watching online, we will only be using the King James Bible in this course. All right, well, to begin, say, what is a sacrifice? If anyone in the class wants to try to venture a guess, uh, just a generic definition. Go ahead, brother. Something given or killed uh, for an offering to God. Yeah, that's much uh, in a biblical sense what it would be. Uh, Webster's 1828, which is what I'll usually take my definitions from, Describes it as destruction, surrender, or loss made or incurred for gaining some object or for obliging another. You know, in generic sense, it's the giving up of something of value to gain something of greater value, or at least perceived value. In you know, a more biblical sense, it's you know, something that is offered up to God. Uh, usually an animal, sometimes uh, something else. Anybody happen to know the first time there's a sacrifice in the scriptures? It's quite early on. Uh, was the first sin. When Adam sinned, <laughs> they killed something for their clothes. Yeah, that would be correct. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Here the scripture says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Brother Larry mentioned, it goes back to the very first sin in the garden there. The very, we see the very first sacrifice, and we notice that God made the sacrifice here, which points again to Christ and Him being the sacrifice for sin. Well, also you can note that Adam's sacrifice, if you will, his, his idea of covering his sin wasn't sufficient, was it? Him and Eve sewed together some fig leaves and tried to cover themselves, but God made them coats of skin here. I know it's not maybe as direct saying that God sacrificed, but obviously he had to sacrifice something to make coats of skin. Right. If my understanding of the scripture is correct before this, there had been no death, even physical death. You know, Hebrews 9.22 tells us, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Next we have the offering, which is different. Anybody want to venture what an offering would be biblically? It's a, it's a, a offering is a gift uh, not of Anything compared with the tithe, it's just a offering that you give or, or that you receive uh, through love. 
in the Old Testament sense, it's the sacrifice being given to God. <laughs> I don't understand what you're saying. When we give willingly of our money, that's really how we offer in the New Testament. Uh, Webster's defines an offering as that which is presented in divine service, which that could be you know, our tithes and offerings, or that could be, as he goes on to say, an animal or a portion of bread or corn or of gold and silver or other valuable articles presented to God as an atonement for sin or as a return of thanks for his favor or for other religious purposes. Like I said, biblically, it's when they would give the sacrifice to God. They would offer it up to him as a, it's in its simplest definition, it is a gift. Oblation is another word that scriptures use sometimes to call an offering. Anybody want to know what the first offering is in the scriptures? It's not very long after our last example. Brother Adam? Uh, Cain and Abel. Yes. And they give us, from the very beginning, the, a picture of what is a right and wrong offering. Uh, Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 and 5 in particular. Uh, the previous verses tell us that Eve bore these two children, that Cain was a t tiller of the ground, at, or I mean, Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Verse 4 says, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Oh, I think we all have heard the story of Cain and Abel. You know, the rest of the story goes on. Cain was a bit jealous, if you will, and killed Abel because he was favored with God instead of Cain. There's a lot of theories on what was wrong with Cain's offering. You know, I've heard some say that it was because it was the work of his hands, but really Abel had to work to keep the sheep. Cain had to work to till the ground, and neither of them would have had success, if you will, without the blessings of God. You, know, you can plant and water and do all that, but if God doesn't give the increase, it's not going to grow. Right. If God doesn't bless the sheep, they're not going to be fruitful and multiply. They're going to get sick and die. I think there's a few things we can point out here. One, it just says Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and offered unto the Lord. It doesn't say that he brought of the first fruits of his offering. Some have supposed that he maybe brought his leftovers or got enough for him and then brought his offering to God. Well, the offering to God was supposed to be the first fruits, if you will, the finest. As we see in Abel's offering, it says that he brought the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. He didn't bring the little sickling, the little runt that was about to die. Well, we said a sacrifice was giving of something of value to grain, something of greater value. You can't give up something that you were going to lose anyway. You know, we make sacrifices every, most every day, I'd say, in this life, or at least that used to be the American way, to sacrifice to gain more. You know, I'd say all of us that have jobs here, we had to sacrifice our time to our employer. Certainly he pays us back in money and benefits. Well, sometimes we sacrifice time with the family to work overtime to pay the bills. So we are giving up something of value, our time, in order to gain something we perceive as of greater value or greater need, at least. Right. But here they are, no doubt, offering up a offering for their sin, if they, just as I'm sure their parents had taught them the need to do. But Cain had it wrong here. Like I said, Cain, it doesn't say that he brought the first fruits. It just says he brought the fruit. It doesn't say that he brought the, brought of the best there was, but it does say that Abel brought the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, the fattest thereof, you could say. <laughs> I think Hebrews also gives us a clue. Hebrews 11.4 tells us, By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. I think one of the big differences between 
Cain and Abel's sacrifice. Abel did it by faith, and Cain did not. You know, faith has been important all the way back to Genesis. Mm-hmm. See, we've already quoted Hebrews twice. You see why it has its own week to study. <laughs> We're going on to our next. There's five primary offerings in the scriptures. We mentioned those earlier. They're the burnt offering, the meat offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. And conveniently enough, they're located in Leviticus chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. In that order. So we'll be spending a a week in each of those chapters, Lord willing. The meat offering is a little different than the other offerings. We it's an offering of meal. Most all the other offerings can contain uh, animal sacrifice, if you will. And there's some other offerings mentioned in the Bible. They're usually part of or hand in hand with the major offerings. There, the drink offering, the free will offering, the heave offering, the thank offering, the weave offering, and the jealousy offering. Does anyone know about the jealousy offering? It's a little bit different than the rest. <laughs> It's a, you can read it. We won't read it tonight. But in Numbers chapter 5, verses 14 through 31, they describe the jealousy offering. This offering was if a, for a man if he thought his wife had, as we would say, cheated on him, had been unfaithful. He was to bring this offering before the priest. And this was a very specific offering. It was similar to the meat offering. It's to be a tenth part of an ephah of barley meal and to put no oil or frankincense thereon. You'll see the connection when we get to week three. If you're wondering how much a tenth part of an ephah of barley meal is, an ephah, or ephah, sorry, is said to be equal to a bushel, which is said to be about 9.3 gallons or 35 liters. So a tenth part of that would be just under a gallon or three and a half liters of, of barley meal. Interestingly enough, barley is one of the main ingredients used to make traditional beer. <laughs> But they were to bring this before the Lord, this or for the priest, excuse me. And the priest would take holy water and take dust from the floor of the tabernacle, put it in the water. Then he would stick his hand in the water, and he would come before the woman. He'd uncover her, and he'd say, "Well, if you haven't sinned, then you're free from the curse of this bitter water," as he calls it. But if you have sinned, the Bible says that. Let's see if. I got it written near my notes somewhere. It says, but if she had been unfaithful, it would cause her to thigh to rot and her belly to swell. Now there's some debate on what that exactly means. It does seem to at least mean that she would not be able to conceive again. The priest would then take the offering, it says, and wave it before the Lord, and he would take a handful of the meal and burn it on the altar. Then give the woman the water to drink, and she would drink it. Then if she hadn't sinned, she would be free from the curse, and it says she would go on to conceive seed. And if she had sinned, the curse would come upon her. Mm-hmm. So, so that's a bit a bit of a change from the other offerings, but I thought it was interesting. And Oops. <laughs> Interesting enough to talk about a little bit here. Like I said, next week we will be going on to the burnt offering, which will be in Leviticus chapter 1 if you want to go ahead and read up on that. The next five weeks will be on each of these offerings here. The burnt offering, the meat offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering. I... Give you a little bit of homework if you can find the first mention of a burnt offering in the scriptures. Yes, uh, not going to be too long tonight. We're just kind of doing an introduction. But does anyone have any questions? I just mentioned how the, the jealousy offering is similar to it and the, okay. what you brought before it. We'll see 
it was also to be a meal, but you were to mix oil and frankincense in with it. Unlike the, the jealousy offering, you were to mix no oil or frankincense in with it. It was not a offering of animal meat. In that sense, means more of food, not animal meat like we would think of. Yeah. Each of these point to Christ, the burnt offering, the meat offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering. And yes, there is a difference between the sin offering and the trespass offering. We often talk of those as one item, but there is a difference in the offerings. And that may be totally <laughs> not, is there a wave offering? Yeah, that was... There's six other offerings mentioned, and they all go either hand in hand with one of the major offerings, or are a component of one of the major offering, major offerings. Well, Jared would ask. Uh, he was talking about the uh, offering between Cain and Abel, and uh, Cain, uh, Abel brought the fat of the the fat of the sheep. Yeah. Okay, now, I, I want to ask this question. Was it talking about the inward fat or the better of the sheep? The way I understand it, it was talking about the better of the sheep, the fattest of the sheep, if you will. Because okay, I know in, in some of the things, though, they burnt the fat. Yeah, and I think it's, I don't know if it's in the burnt offering or one of the other ones, it's, yeah. they take the fat and burn it. Right, right. <laughs> but I'm sure, I don't know if, doesn't really tell us what if they burnt the offering or if they just killed it. And we do see a, really a type, if you will, of Christ, even in that how that he was as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Revelation says. Well, I was thinking about the uh, <laughs> bringing the sheep as an offering if it was alive or dead. Now, if it was alive. That's the reason I wanted to ask that fat. Because, uh, or, but if it was dead, then there was the shedding of the blood. Which I think they came and they killed it at the altar. Yeah, okay. And then put it off. I love Jesus being crucified. <laughs> See, there, the offerings are described in very great detail in the law, but they were present before the law. Mm -hmm. We see Abraham offering sacrifices we see Noah offering sacrifices we see obviously Cain and Abel and I yeah. imagine Adam would have too mm -hmm. they learned it from somewhere <laughs> we even see Elijah offering sac burnt sacrifices which we'll get to in the next week Job, which you know, some say is the oldest book of the Old Testament, but his offering almost seemed like the sin offering of Leviticus chapter four. Yeah. It was a offering for sins of ignorance. Yeah. Right, Adam, do you have something? Yeah, I hope to see that as we progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> like I said, the, we'll look a little bit how it points to Christ uh, in the next several lessons, but we'll really draw it out when we get to the New Testament to see how you'll see it in, actually happen. And, like I, said, I have a plan for I think five weeks in the New Testament. I hope that's enough to cover everything. I've sh like I said Matthew and Mark are pretty similar in their accounts. Luke and John offer some different details that the others don't offer. 
And of course, Paul talks extensively on the Christ crucifixion. There are several New Testament books that don't mention much directly about it, though. Like I said, Hebrews goes into quite a bit of detail about the sacrifice and how Christ was really the ultimate sacrifice. And I, for anyone watching online, I did include some contact info in case anyone needs to contact us. All right. I think that'll wrap us up. I went through a little quicker than I expected to, but... I'm sure we'll be a little bit longer the next few weeks. Yeah. First night of class is always short. <laughs> All right.